Good, uh, good day and um, welcome to this uh, second episode of uh, Cash Talks. My name is uh, Guillaume Lepec. I'm the chair of um, Cash Essentials, which is hosting this uh, webinar. Um, just a couple of quick um, housekeeping guidelines. Um, you have a uh, chat room on the right hand side of your screen as well as a uh, Q&A uh, tab, uh, which, as the name may suggest, um, is, 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 should be used for submitting questions. Um, thirdly, the, 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 the session um, is being recorded and the recording will be made um, available following the, uh, the, the session. A um, couple of words on the Cash Essentials. We are a... Um, small but uh, global independent think tank um, whose mission is to um, monitor ongoing developments and undertake research and analysis on um, cash and its future 
um, but also to provide a platform for discussion and debate on cash payments and the monetary landscape. Um, please uh, visit our website for further information. This webinar is uh, the second of a series called Cash Talks, which address and discuss critical uh, trends and issues in the cash space. Um, and today we will focus specifically on the issues arriving from the parallel circulation of cash and central bank digital currencies. The, the research and development of central bank digital currencies is undeniably a, a hot topic in the monetary landscape. According to the um, Bank for International Settlements, there are currently three live retail CBDCs, one in the Bahamas, another in the Eastern Caribbean, um, a third in Nigeria. Interestingly, two, two of those um, uh, central banks uh, uh, have just received rewards for their uh, new banknote series. Um, another 28 countries are running pilots um, and 68 central banks have publicly uh, communicated about their ongoing work. John Kiff will, will provide us with a far more comprehensive um, overview of where we stand in terms of uh, the development of digital currencies. But I think one event um, has acted as a strong catalyst uh, for CBDC research, and that's Facebook's announcement in, in, in June 2019 to launch its own stablecoin, stablecoin. And the project triggered massive backlash from government regulators to central banks around the globe. In uh, last January, Facebook, or, or rather Meta, as it's now known, um, announced the end of its um, monetary ambitions um, and, and sold the assets um, of what had become DM. Um, it will be interesting to see whether um, uh, this will change the, uh, the, the, the appetite uh, for CBDC. So lots of research, um, but research doesn't always translate into implementation. Um, I think it's important to navigate between the hype and the reality. It's perhaps not very well known, but some countries have discontinued their digital currencies. Ecuador's Electronico Dinero, uh, launched in 2014, failed to reach a critical mass and was discontinued in 2018. Finland, um, which possibly was the first world, the, the, the world's first digital currency in the 90s, um, had also discontinued the circular, the, 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 the project in the mid 2000s. Um, and we'll be hearing what lessons can be learned from the Finnish experience um, later on. Other central banks are still struggling to establish a business case. Um, in November last year, the Monetary Authority of Singapore concluded that, and I quote, um, there is no pressing need for a retail CBDC in Singapore at this point in time. Demand for cash domestically remains some way from the minimum threshold where concerns of the negative implications from the lack of cash in circulation might rise. In um, January this year, the UK House of Lords concluded there was no convincing case for a central bank digital currency. Um, and called it a solution in search of a problem. And then we have the largely unexplored question of cash and CBDC and whether and how they can coexist. Motivations behind um, the exploration of CBDC is very significantly, but, but cash is almost always central to the, to the debate. Some countries aim to offer central bank money in a less cash future. Others, on the contrary, hope to stimulate a less cash-heavy economy. Nonetheless, most central banks are committed to provide central bank digital currency that emulates but not eliminates cash. And I'll quote my compatriot, uh, Christine Lagarde, president of the ECB, who said back in 2020, the euro system will continue to ensure that all citizens have access to banknotes at all times. A digital euro in any event would be a complement to, not a substitute for, cash. But this raises a great deal of questions, not only in terms of policy, 
but also operational as well as communication issues. And I hope that we can address uh, some of those today. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce our, our, our first panelist, John Kiff. Uh, John was a senior financial sector expert at the International Monetary Fund from 2005 to 2021. Prior to that, um, he spent 25 years at the Bank of Canada, where he spent mo most of his time managing the funding and investment of the government's foreign exchange reserves. More recently, um, John has been focusing on fintech issues and particularly CBDC. John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Guillaume. Let me just share my screen here. There we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about retail, central bank, digital currency, and that's been something that's been preoccupying a lot of my time since about 2017. These papers you see on the cover here, those are the three sort of landmark papers that I was involved in while working at the, the IMF. The most recent one is that uh, behind the scenes paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago. So moving on, yeah, here's the chart that that shows the growth in central bank retail CBDC experimentation by launch year, at least the launch year in my case being the year in which um, it became publicly known that the central bank was um, experimenting with central bank digital currency. And back in 2017, um, when we started looking at this at the IMF, there was about 15 central banks that were known to be um, kicking the tires of um, CBDC. You see now that there's about 80 or so that uh, are now in the CBDC game. We'll go into a little more detail on who's doing what in a minute. But before we move on, I kind of like to make sure we're all clear about um, what is a central bank digital currency, particularly a retail CBDC. And this tab table kind of shows for different types of digital currency what the key criteria are. Um, so in, we're all clear that, um, that we've got the right definition. So first of all, the retail CBDCs, this core definitions are, are encompassed in that dark shaded portion up in the top left-hand corner. So first of all, it has to be denominated in the jurisdiction's unit of account. So in the case of say a US dollar, retail CBDC, it has to be denominated in US dollars. That takes out of the picture, for instance, something like Bitcoin, um, which um, is denominated and it's not denominated in any 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 particular jurisdiction's unit of account. The unit of account is basically the 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 the, the, the currency that's in use in that particular jurisdiction for buying coffees and shopping and so on. Also, it has to be backed by the jurisdiction's monetary authority issued by that monetary authority and a direct liability of the monetary authority or, or a central bank in most cases. We, we say jurisdiction's monetary authority because we've got some like um, ECB that covers a whole, whole cluster of countries. And to be a retail CBDC it has to be broadly accessible to the general public. And, after, and so that that those are the indisputable definitions of a retail CBDC. One might also add that it needs to be available for peer-to-peer -peer transactions and 24-7 for instant settlement. And um, I highlighted division, divisible, interchangeable, or fungible because that is rather important too, that uh, I say one unit, a 10-unit CBDC should be the same as um, 10 individual single units of CBDC. So it can be broken up and made, made, made change for. There's other definitions which we won't have time to delve into, but I think the ones that I've given you here in that, sh in that shaded portion are the key ones. The other important thing to realize is that um, you might think that uh, CBDC necessarily runs on digital, I'm sorry, distributed ledger technology, but indeed um, that's not true at all. The central bank digital currencies, the retail variety, um, come on, on all kinds of different ledger technology, including good old fashioned centralized ledgers. So here's my tabulation. You can see the link at the bottom. Um, you can keep, see this anytime in a, on a real time basis. So there's these lists, the 80 central banks that have been taking a look at uh, CBDC. Um, we've had seven of them so far that have either launched pilots or actually done the full launch. Bahamas has fully launched its sand dollar. And then there's an, um, 12, 15 countries that have done proof of concepts and a pilot, the difference between a pilot and a POC is that a, a pilot is actually tested with the general public, whereas a POC or proof of concept is typically done in a lab kind of setting. In the case of Ukraine, for instance, they, they did their 
pilot with um, the staff of the of the of the uh, central bank, and, and they recruited a couple of local merchants to test it out. Then the rest of them on this page are where um, they they haven't launched POCs or pilots, at least not knowingly. I don't I haven't seen the evidence of that. Um, but there's um, the one the, the top slice of that four countries, including Canada, are very advanced stages and very likely have done proof of concepts already, but haven't publicized it. And then there's this, these two other big clusters here that uh, um, they're in various stages of their, their research. Some are just starting out, some of them have been doing it for quite a while. At the bottom, there's actually two central banks that have tested, uh, sorry, launched and actually cut, um, cut short their launch, um, Ecuador from 2014 to 2018. <clears throat> and Finland started out in 1992 and shut down in 06. So if you want proof that it needs does not need to be done using distributed ledger technology, there's your proof. Finland and the Finland launched it before 2008 when Satoshi's paper was published. So it was a good old fashioned centralized ledger. In terms of the motivations, um, there's constant, certain common themes can be clustered by whether the country is a advanced economy country like Canada, China, ECE, or whether it's an emerging market country like the, the five at the top. And the, the ones that the, the EMDE, emerging market and development economy countries tend to focus on financial inclusion um, as a motivation and efficiency, which generally means they're trying to cost, save some money. They uh, hopefully, they're hoping that they can uh, reduce or eliminate the use of cash and, and, and save some money with CBDC. And resilience speaks to the fact that in many EMD countries, they're subject to um, natural disaster risk and so on. So they're looking for a, a digital currency that can be robust with respect to um, the uh, natural disaster risk. And then the for the advanced economy countries, they share some of those motivations, but they also are very concerned about access to central bank money. You'll see that all of them in this cluster here um, have said that it basically means they fear that private money of one sort or another, whether it be crypto, stable coins, or even just um, PayPal and other other digital currency media, that, that they're they're monopolizing um, the the payment the payment streams in that country, and they they feel that their that central bank money is being kind of pushed aside. Sweden's like a cho poster child for that. Um, something like eighty or ninety percent of all transactions are done at a single um, private sector payment platform called Swish. Um, and so that, uh, that's why, in fact, you'll see that um, another concern that Sweden has is countering monopoly distortions. Uh, the, and that's a big one for China, too, because Alipay and WeChat Pay totally dominate digital currency rails there, too. There's other various um, um, policy goals, including cross-border payments, uh, government to GDP, government to person payments and monetary policy. I might have time to go into those a little later. In terms of design, considerations, it's all are outsourcing the user facing activity. So that diagram at the top is what you might think immediately is how a CBDC works. That, um, people, users have direct accounts at the central bank. That's just not the way it's playing out. Most, in fact, all so far have leaned towards the, what we call the intermediated CBDC, um, where the central bank issues the digital currency, but it's distributed and managed with respect to end users um, by banks and other payment service providers. There's another model called the synthetic CBDC that no one has tried yet, um, which is essentially a, um, a stable coin, I mean, a stable coin being a crypto asset that's pegged to the value of a fiat currency. Um, and so the synthetic CBDC would be um, something along the lines of a, C a stable coin, for instance, a tether, but the assets that back it would be um, deposits at the central bank. But it it seems like the, in practice, there, there's not much difference between a synthetic CBDC, intermediated CBDC, but the legal structure of the intermediate CBDC is, seems to be more friendly to most central bank needs. And this is just a very detailed look at actually the actual functions of issuing and managing a CBDC program. And you can see why a central bank may not want to get their hands too dirty on some of this, this work, including things like the uh, onboarding customers doing all that KYC, AML, running wallets, customer service, which means like um, running the call center for people that have problems with their their cards, managing user data. So you can see it, it varies about it varies in where the central bank um, kind of 
releases its touch on the CBDC and where the intermediaries take over. But uh, generally, once you get to the point where you're dealing directly with customers, um, that's done in that blue zone, which is by the intermediaries. That's all. This is all from a survey that was done in the paper that's referenced below, so you can follow up on on this if you're interested. And it's um, then then the next the next big decision factor would be: do you do you apply transaction fees and do you remunerate it? Remuneration simply means do you pay interest on the, on the CBDC? And in terms of transaction fees, none are being charged on current launches and pilots, um, but um, some central bank banks are concerned about how they compensate intermediaries to, to do all that to donkey work of, of issuing and running a CBDC platform. So you might see some central banks uh, launch CBDCs that have fees. Brazil, for instance, has said that they, they might, if they offer a CBDC, they might uh, have charges, transaction fees on them, um, but it'd be less than what's being charged by banks and other private companies. None are paying interest on the CBDC, and that, that's usually usually that's said because the as the central bank wants to make sure that this CBDC is as cash like as possible. Um, but there's there's reasons, and academics are pretty excited about interest payments. Um, they they think that it could be used to enhance monetary policy transmissions by increasing people's response to changes in the policy rate. Right now, when the policy rate changes, it's the only rate that changes in reality is the rate charged to um, um, commercial banks um, doing business with the, the central bank. So there's kind of a, a there's kind of an extra step in between the user and the central bank. So that's one possible reason. Another would be you could um, enable negative interest rates so you could break through the zero lower bound on policy rates. Catch there is that you have to make that to make that work, you have to either eliminate use of cash or make cash holdings costly. So it's kind of a more of a it's kind of a pie in the sky. A motivation right now um, but the other thing is intermediation could increase um, disintermediation and run risk and disintermediation risk is basically the risk that you create a central bank digital currency that's so so attractive that uh, people move money from their banks their bank deposits into cbdc um, the, the way that's that's being being controlled in practice is that um, like i said before no cbdc has been launched or piloted is carry an interest it's not remunerated and they also apply holding and transaction limits um, to to limit the, the extent to which people can transfer funds across from bank accounts into cbdc there's also concern that of run risk that the cbdc might provide a convenient flight to safety vehicle for retail depositors um, that's again mitigated by holding transaction limits and the, the the risk of a run risk should be pretty low in for most countries since most countries have uh, deposit insurance in place so um there's not that fear that we're gonna you know if the bank goes kaput that you're gonna lose your money um so that that's these are the ways that they this intermediation and run risk are being uh, mitigated also um the the central banks need to design a cbdc that's uh, that's uh, compliant with the aml cft standards um and so that means they have to collect information on users and track transactions and so on um and then and, and the way that's being um, that's being handled in practice is is, a, is what's called proportionality. The, the, the AML CFT rules allow central banks to apply proportionality to the um, to the rules. So um, that's why what you'll see most central banks doing is they offer what we call tiered uh, limits. So you could have for very low limit holdings, they could be attained with very low requirements for KYC and other um, data requirements. Also. Um, the central banks, remember we said before, they're, they're delegating a lot of the donkey work to um, the, the commercial banks and other payment service providers. So they, the, those, those intermediaries, they see all this um, information flow um, in, in these accounts. And typically in the pilot so far, the central bank sees only pseudo anonymous data. And if they observe suspicious activity in that pseudo anonymous data, they can then ask for that data to be de-anonymized and usually with something like a court order, there's gotta be a process to make sure that central banks don't frivolously um, download that data. And this is just a very detailed um, look. You can, uh, I'm hoping that these slides can be made available so you can see the details of the, the way that the central banks are actually implementing all of these different uh, 
um, risk mitigants and also how they're they're trying to make the CBDC attractive to meet their their policy goals. Cross border CBDC is more like an aspirational thing because I think in order to have, to launch a CBDC that's cross border enabled, you'd have to also make sure that uh, you've you've made that CBDC interoperable on a technical level and then on a legal and regulatory level with other countries um, CBDC. And so mapping all that out on a bilateral basis would be a big job. And that's why um, I would encourage any central bank that wants to offer a cross-border enabled CBDC, it should just join in the efforts being led by the BIS Innovation Hub and other international organizations like uh, the IMF and the World Bank and the FSB. They're, they are very actively working on ways to make CBDC um, cross-border enabled on a, on a global basis. And this is just a, a snapshot of the technology platforms used in launches and pilots. And you'll see it on the right. Again, DLT, not the only way to go. There's, there's different types of platforms out there being used in the launches and pilots, including um, the, the Ecuador one was done with a centralized ledger. Uruguay's a pilot that's done in 2017, centralized. But then Jamaica's running it on a very unique digital bearer instrument basis. Um, Bahamas is on a DLT platform. And that's basically the end of my presentation. But here, to your reading pleasure, there's a, there's a lot of interesting references that you can follow up for a much deeper dive into this, um, into this topic. And so I'll end there and pass the baton back to Guillaume. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I believe it's um, Aristotle who um, you said the, the 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 more you know, the more you know you don't know. And um, looking at the, uh, the 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 at your presentation, I think it clearly shows the amount of research that has been put into this around the globe. Uh, but it also highlights that various countries have opted for quite different solutions in 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 certainly in terms of technology, uh, but also in terms of policy. Um, and, and, and possible business models. Um, let us now move on uh, to our um, next uh, presenter. And it is my pleasure to introduce Alexey Grimm. He is head of uh, FinTech at the Bank of Finland uh, and leads a team that manages a portfolio of projects related to FinTech, new payment technologies and digital currencies. He's a member of the uh, Euro Systems Digital Euro Project Steering Group. Um, and before joining the um, Central Bank of Finland, he worked in the consulting and technology investment industry for 15 years in London and Helsinki. Alexei, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexei Grimm. I'm head of FinTech at the Bank of Finland. And my presentation is uh, about CBDC and whether history is repeating itself. So digital currencies have been a very hot topic recently. And you might have seen uh, articles in the media, uh, such as this one in The Economist, talking about digital currencies taking over and becoming a kind of payment um, method for the age of the internet. What's interesting about this particular article is that it's over 20 years old. Um, in fact, it was more than 20 years ago that uh, the idea of putting money on the web or the internet uh, started emerging pretty much as soon as the internet became a sort of widespread phenomenon. Here's another article from the same magazine talking about, again, digital currencies, but this time it's about a specific type of uh, digital currency, namely Bitcoin. But even this article is about 10 years old. So this was about 10 years later from the first example. And now finally, here's a third example talking about central bank digital currencies. And again, this is another approximately 10 years later. So it seems that ever since the emergence of the internet or the World Wide Web, um, the idea of putting money on the web, um, you know, almost immediately became an, a widespread idea. And 
depending on the era, uh, the solution was called a little bit different. So in the first wave, uh, already in the 1990s, um, the concept was called e-money. And we still have e-money today, and I'll come back to that later. But the concept was basically called e-money. In the second wave, about 10 years later, with the emergence of Bitcoin, we started talking about cryptocurrencies and virtual currencies or even digital currencies. And now in the kind of third wave, we talk about central bank digital currencies. So what's interesting about all of these is that they more or less talk about the same thing, but using slightly different terminology. So going back even further, um, the Bank of Finland was actually probably the first central bank that's launched um, e-money or, or CBDC. In today's terminology, you could call it CBDC. So already in 1993, the Bank of Finland developed and uh, put on the market a, an e-money product, which was a, in the form of a payment card. So you can see the, the card is very similar in appearance to the payment cards we use today, but it worked differently. Uh, so this card was a prepaid card, uh, and it was e-money, um, which was stored on the card itself. So in that sense, it's it's a little bit different from the debit and credit cards that we use today. So as I mentioned, this was already developed in the you know the development started in the late 1980s. It's basically developed in the early 1990s and uh, launched on the market in 1993. So that was a long time ago. And of course, there were other similar products in other markets. So this was only used in Finland, but there were similar cards um, used in other markets like Mondex and Geldkarte in Germany. Uh, the distinguishing feature about the Avant card was that it was developed and operated by a central bank. So in that sense, it was a CBDC in the sense that we mean today. A few more words about the technology. So this was really a, a step change in terms of um, payment technology, because you have to remember that before smart cards, uh, debit and credit cards were magnetic stripe cards. And using a chip on a card, basically having computing power on the card itself, uh, was a real game changer. And this kind of prepaid e-money card was the first way to utilize that technology. So it's very intuitive. You think about putting money on the card in digital form. In that sense, like literally digital currency, putting it on a card. Um, it later turned out that it's actually better to use this technology slightly differently. And that's how we use credit and debit cards today. So we don't actually store the money on the card when we use credit cards or debit cards. We only use the card to sign transactions and the money itself is deposited in a bank. It turns out that's probably uh, at least more user, more user friendly. It's more convenient. Uh, it might also be safer. Um, so you don't see much, many of these stored value cards on the market anymore. In fact, Avant also ceased to exist in about 2006. So it was around for about 10 years. Um, but already after the first three years, it was um, divested. Uh, so the central bank sold the business to commercial banks, it was sold to a consortium of commercial banks, and they um, offered it as a, an additional product to their bank customers. So the bank customers had the option of using a debit card, a credit card, or a stored value e-money card. It, it then turned out um, that debit cards and credit cards were much more user-friendly. People preferred to use them. So the stored value card um, was discontinued in, in 2006. But that was an example of one of the first e-money products. So the, the whole category of e-money products emerged around that time. So in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And the concept really was to have some sort of electronic or digital version of cash. Because still, I mean, people did have bank deposits and they were able to do debit transactions uh, already back then. So there wasn't really um, it wasn't just about having a different card to do 
those kinds of transactions. It was really a different concept entirely. In other words, it was a, the idea was to have a replacement for cash, something that you can, you know, a bearer instrument, something you carry around with you. But it never became popular. So if you look today, uh, e-money, the, the amount of outstanding e-money in the eurozone is about 15 billion euros, and that's not really very much if you compare it to bank, bank deposits or cash in circulation. And what's more, um, practically all of this, all of these 15 billion uh, euros of e-money are actually on you know, stored in, uh, as payment accounts, so they're not actually they're not actually stored value cards or prepaid instruments. There are actually um, some types of accounts. So then, you know, e-money um, didn't really take off the way people maybe uh, thought it would in the 1990s. Um, but the concept re-emerged, but this time in the form of CBDC. So again, now we're thinking, it would be nice to have a digital or electronic version of banknotes of cash. Um, so as you know, of course, central banks already um, offer two types of um, money monetary products essentially. So you have central bank deposits, but only financial institutions can have them. And then you have banknotes, which are for the general public. So CBDC would be something in between these two. So it would be digital in the sense that it would be um, kind of like a, a payment account, like a like a deposit in that sense. But it would be um, like banknotes because it would be available to anyone. So it would be a general purpose payment instrument. And that's really the idea of CBDC. And that's how, for example, the Eurozone has defined their own project, the Digital Euro Project. So if you compare CBDC with e-money, uh, you can see that there's a lot of overlap. Um, I'm hesitant to say that they are exactly the same. They're very close in terms of like, uh, how they're defined and what kind of concepts they are. I guess the key difference is that when you talk about e-money, uh, the definition of e-money is not specific about who the issuer is. Basically, any business can issue e-money. Usually it's a payment institution or a bank but it, it's not specific about who the issuer is anyone can issue e-money um, whereas if you compare to cbdc cbdc is very specific about who the issuer is so it's specifically the central bank that is issuing it so for some reason today when we talk about cbdc we think that it's really important that the the digital version of cash is offered by the central bank. I guess we, we think that otherwise it's not really proper um, central bank money. But 25, 30 years ago when e-money emerged, for some reason it wasn't considered an important aspect back then. I think still today um, there are two possible models for either CBDC or e-money. And I think this, this really hasn't changed in 30 years. So as I mentioned, some of the first e-money products were stored value cards, and those are something we would now call value-based instruments. So the monetary value is stored on the payment instrument itself. So it's stored on the card itself. There's no central ledger anywhere where you could see how much money is on each card. It's the, the information is only on the card. Of course, instead of a card, you could use a mobile phone or any other um, object that has an embedded chip in them. And this effectively is a bearer instrument. So whoever whoever is in possession of that instrument, whoever is in possession of that object, owns the money. And that gives you a high degree of privacy. So this is the concept of early e-money. And now we would call that value-based CBDC. The other type of CBDC that you can have is account-based. So instead of having a, a stored value payment instrument, you have accounts. You have someone who maintains the accounts. Um, and then you have a, an instrument that you can use to initiate payment transactions. And that's how our bank accounts today work, and that's how debit cards and credit cards essentially work. And this, this kind of dichotomy of account-based versus value-based really hasn't changed. So we can still 
uh, design a an e-money or CBDC product either way. So if we look at the European project, uh, Digital Euro, um, how would that look like in practice? So the project is still in the very um, early stages. So it's it's currently in a, what we call an investigation phase, which will continue for another year and a half at least. Um, so we, we don't have the specific design yet, but we already, I think we can already say that the, it, it's supposed to be a general purpose payment instrument. And for that to be true, then it would have to be accepted uh, in the most common payment situations, like point of sale at, at different shops, uh, supermarkets, and so on. Also, of course, online e-commerce would be um, an important application. You would have to be able to make person-to-person -person payments and probably also um, fund and defund this instrument from your bank accounts. So, and that of course requires it to be interoperable with existing payment rails. In other words, it should be able, to, you should be able to use the digital euro to make payments on bank accounts and vice versa. So we kind of want it to be very interoperable. It needs to be connected to all the common situations that we make payments today. But then we also want it to be very cash-like. We want it to have a high degree of privacy. It should be free of charge for the end user and so on. And this inevitably raises the question of, you know, do we want too much? Is this too much to ask from a digital payment solution? Like we want it to be like a bank account in many ways, but we also want it to be like a bank note in many ways. And this puts a lot of um, you know, expectations on something like a digital euro. Can we actually have both? Um, you could think that um, these are actually a trade-off, that if you want a high degree of privacy, if you want it to be like cash, then you maybe don't, you know, you, maybe you can't have as much interoperability and as many uh, usability features as, as you would otherwise be able to have. In any case, um, the digital euro is, is not going to be a replacement for banknotes. And I think the euro system has been very consistent and very uh, um, clear on this. And it's no wonder if you look at the if you, if you look at this chart, for example, um, which shows euro banknotes in circulation. Uh, I mean, there's no sign of uh, diminishing demand for banknotes. Uh, quite the contrary, actually. Uh, there seems to be strong demand and even growing demand for banknotes. Um, so it doesn't seem like cash is going away anywhere. So whatever the digital euro is going to be, I think it's quite certain to say that um, cash will also be around uh, and circulate alongside any sort of digital payment instrument for a long time. So. I'm kind of summarizing here that um, the idea of putting money on a digital payment instrument or putting, you know, even shorter, putting money on the web, that idea has been around for at least 25, 30 years. And it's been called by different names. Uh, it's been called e-money, it's been called digital currencies, and it's been called CBDC. But the basic idea is always the same. And in designing such an instrument, it's important to ask the question, you know, how much do we want to be like cash and how much do we want to utilize and take advantage of all the possibilities that digital um, technology enables? Because there might be a trade-off there. So for example, privacy, uh, asset safety, something that you know, those are features that are often attributed to banknotes and cash. Um, if we look at the experience uh, uh, from and the lessons learned from the Avant card that the Bank of Finland developed uh, in the 90s, it turned out that people really didn't expect to have um, the same degree of privacy or asset safety when they were using a digital payment instrument. So it might be that uh, people are quite willing to um, you know, forego some of the benefits of cash when they use digital payment instruments and might be that people are actually quite well aware of the um, pros and cons of each 
And this would imply that the future uh, is maybe one where um, banknotes will continue to exist for a very long time, but we will also have uh, various types of digital payment instruments, but they will never be um, really competing with each other. They're simply two diff very different types of payment instruments that can exist um, alongside each other. So that's really it. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to having a discussion around this topic now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Alexi, for, for a somewhat nostalgic journey into um, payments history. Um, I happen to be old enough to have known um, many of these uh, e-money uh, products and have, have, have also seen them disappear over time. Uh, 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 low adoption may certainly been have been a, um, a factor, but um, it seems to me that um, that the, the low profitability um, has also played a, uh, a, an important role um, and issuers have simply preferred to promote payment products which were more prof profitable, uh, typically uh, traditional debit and credit cards, um, rather than um, the new money solutions. Um, but let me now um, welcome John and Alexi on stage. Um, and open up the, um, the, 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 the panel discussion. Um, and, and, and yeah, we have a, a, a number of questions already, but uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with one first. And we, we've seen that most research assumes that <clears throat> CBDC should emulate um, uh, the attributes of cash and should complement rather than substitute. Um, but do you think this is really uh, uh, realistic? Um, both of you have mentioned some limitations, but what are, what are, are, are your thoughts on, 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 on the coexistence? Well, perhaps I'll, I'll start. Um, I mean, Lexi mentioned uh, what, exactly what I, what, I, what I think too, that, uh, that what we're seeing in the, in the wild right now in terms of actual launches of pilots and launches absolute launches is a is really a product that looks a lot more like e-money than uh, than say the value-based uh, money that uh, you know the, the paper money or physical cash is is the classic value-based money and we're not seeing very many in fact we've seen no implementations of a value-based the cbdc yet and one of the reasons why is that uh, um, central bankers get very cold feet about offering something that could allow people to circumvent um, those the financial integrity regulations, the, the financial action task force, AML, CFT um, requirements, and and some fear that um, offering up a pure value-based um, type of money where it's totally anonymous, um, you open the, the Pandora's box to all um, sorts of uh, naughty business on that on that side, illicit finance, tax evasion, the whole nine yards. And I think you can d design that away. Um, but still, I think central bankers are aiming more for like that e-money um, type of experience because I, you know, I've, I've got that that tabulation that I had in my presentation. Um, if you if you put the e-money beside central bank digital currency, the way it's the way it's offered now, the only difference is that a, a central bank digital currency is offered backed um, by by a central bank. Alexi, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I think John is right. Um, in the sense that central banks probably don't even want to, um, you know, some of the features of, of cash, which we take for granted, that it ha gives us a high degree of privacy. Some of those features are exploited by um, you know, money launderers and, and you know, other types of criminal activity. And central banks probably don't even want that in, in a modern payment instrument even if it could be done. I, I remember one central banker once saying that, um, you, know, you know, the fact that cash is uh, un untraceable and, you know, gives you an anonymity, that's a, that's a bug, that's not a feature. I mean, it's something that we wouldn't want to have by design if we would, were to design a perfect payment instrument today. It's something we rather would want to get rid of. I'm not sure if every central banker thinks that way, but th then I think there's the other aspect is that I think there are limitations on how far we can even go. Um, 
in fact, I think we shouldn't be, you know, fooling ourselves into thinking that we could create a digital payment instrument which would be, you know, entirely like cash. Uh, I think there are fundamental differences, and you can, you can never replicate some of the um, features of cash in a digital environment. And you, you're going to hit a limit at some point how far you can actually go in a, in a technical sense. Uh, so I, I think we need to acknowledge that if we're in a digital world and we design a digital payment instrument, there are going to be fundamental differences. Banknotes are always going to be, or cash is always, always going to be special. Uh, you can't have that necessarily uh, one for one in a digital environment. One interesting mean, um, development out there too is a is a, you may be familiar with Franklin Knowles' work on on the smart banknotes and they they kind of bridge the two. It's actually a polymer, I think a polymer type of banknote with a built in some kind of built in chip, something really really skinny that uh, allows you to use a because one of the shortcomings of physical cash is if you do a lot of business online, it's it's useless. You know you can't you know, can't go and buy stuff on Amazon using physical cash, but uh, the these uh, smart banknotes would bridge that because the smart banknote could be used to 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 spend on an e-commerce site. I'm going to contradict you on 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 that one. There's a there's actually quite a lot of business that is done online in cash. Um, possibly the, the the greatest part of the world uses simply cash on delivery. Um, but uh, there are also a number of companies, including Amazon, who have uh, payment products called Amazon Cash, um, which simply enable you to um, uh, feed your 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 Amazon account uh, uh, in in cash. But there are a number of smaller companies around the world that are developing solutions to facilitate. Um, uh, uh, we call them cash tech, but uh, that uh, amongst other things, uh, provide solutions for people to. Um, um pay for online products in using cash um but yeah i guess but, i was being advanced economy centric when i said that uh, and that's because i in here in the us i don't think anybody does um delivery um a payment on delivery but i know uh, you're right i've run into it in some of the um developing uh countries where that's that's because there's not really a well-developed credit culture there well i believe walmart offers that but anyway um m moving on um we um so if i understand correctly um it means a, a, a central bank faced the the dilemma in a way uh, of developing um a cbdc which is attractive to in order to have a sufficient level of a critical mass of adoption um but can be too attractive so as to uh, comply with uh, with uh, KYC uh, and all sorts of uh, FATF uh, rules. Is that uh, is that the the, the, the fine line that uh, we need to navigate? I, I think central banks need to realize, at least you know, at least in Europe, um, a CBDC is going to be competing with commercial offerings, and it's going to be it's going to have to play by the same rules. Um, so rules regarding you know, AML and, and, and so on, but also regarding consumer protection and um, uh, identification and so on. Those rules are for the industry in general. Those are for all types of payments in the, in the digital space. I, I can't imagine a central bank um, you know, getting waived from some of those rules. Of course, it has to uh, comply to the rules, but also the standards that already exist in a highly developed payment space. Um, and that's a very contested market. It's a, it's a very com highly competed market. And the consumers are not going to be able to differentiate very well. Um, they're going to look at it as just another uh, electronic payment instrument. They're going to, going, to, going to compare it to debit cards and PayPal and, and Revolut and so on. Um, so it's it's a it's a really difficult space. Um, that said, at the same time, consumers have a very special, um, you know, they, I don't think they uh, see banknotes, or they, they they I don't think they they will see CBDC uh, as some 
as similar, uh, you know, something like banknotes. I think banknotes have a very special, um, people see it in a very special way. We can see it in crisis situations where, um, you know, even if there's, you know, any, any kind of small uh, crisis situation, people go to ATMs and they withdraw cash. And I don't think you can replace that with offering a, a central bank account. I, I don't think that kind of safe haven um, feature of, of cash is easily transferable to any any type of digital payment instrument. So I think that's that's just good good to keep in mind. I think that speaks also to the you know, the risk of offering a CBDC is is failure, and and we've yet to really see any CBDC take off in a big way. We look at the experience with the launches and pilots so far. It's sure you can say people need time to get used to using these new um, payment rails, but they're not taking up like wildfire and that may be because like i think if the you know, the fed in the us offered a cbdc payment platform i i wouldn't be find very compelling to to move off the existing rails i use venmo and i can use paypal i can use credit cards there's multiple um um <clears throat> digital currencies that i can already use so i think in the especially in advanced economies that uh, there's a big risk of a big flop right hmm. Right, um, we have a whole bunch of questions, so I'm going to take them one by one. Um, first question, um, Jean-Yves Ray, what are the risks of currency privatization if a central bank does not issue CBDC over time? Is this being considered by central banks? Well, I think that's one of the motivations that I, I mentioned that, uh, um, I mean, that is this uh, concern in Sweden and Canada, I think it even is with the um, the ECB, they, they cite as one of their um, their um, motivations is they want to assure that um, residents in Europe will always have access to, to central bank money. And that speaks to the encroachment of MasterCards and Visas and PayPal, particularly the concern that these are foreign owned um, outfits that are dominating the payment scene in, in, in the country or in the, in the jurisdiction. And does the exit of Facebook from this space uh, change the philosophy or the approach or? It, it eases some of the concerns because I think when the Bank of Canada talked about their trigger, um, I think if you read between the lines, they were talking about the fear of uh, face, a Facebook um, um, sponsored um, product. Alexi, yeah, I think anything to big add? techs definitely, yeah, big, big techs definitely have been um, a bit of a scare for for um, central banks and regulators. Um, I'm not sure if the if the project uh, the, the the Libra project um, ever was ever going to succeed. Uh, again, I think it, it also would have faced stiff competition. Uh, maybe something that Facebook realized in the end that. Uh, it's not it's not a blue ocean and you know you, you, it, where you can just easily enter the market you actually have to compete against very strong incumbents um so regardless of whether you're a central bank issuing a cbdc or if you're a big tech issuing a a stable coin um the market is already highly contested and and it's going to be difficult and to enter that market in fact facebook i has has done some some launches of not not big big ideas like DM, but smaller payment um, payment media, and I don't think they've taken off at all. But you both sound as if uh, the commercial banks were, were uh, 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 developing a uh, product uh, in in what is already a competitive space. Um, it, it seems to me that's uh, quite new already in terms of uh, of, of, of philosophy. Well, I think in some cases that 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 I've I've the central banks that I've talked to, they they the problem they're facing is that uh, is that those digital rails exist to some degree in their country. This is particularly for developing countries, but the charges are they feel the charges are too high, and they want to basically come in and and um, out compete with with the lower lower fees and so on. I mean, I would argue that um, there might be a less disruptive way to achieve those same ends. For instance, they could regulate to um, um, fees that in the US they, they've regulated interchange fees, there's caps on those. So that's another alternative the central bank might consider. But some are thinking of offering a retail CBDC too, 
um, kind of in, in some ways a, a failed CBDC wouldn't be a bad thing if that failed CBDC did at least push um, the the incumbents to to offer more attractive or cheaper products. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the payments market is uh, one which has um, economies economies of scale and um, network effects, and that leads to a, a highly highly um, concentrated market. So you, you know we see that now in the in the, in the card schemes. But it's exactly right. I think there would be good reason for a central bank or a public institution to try to bring more competition into that market. And I think that's part of the motivation, at least for the for the digital euro and the eurozone, um, especially since uh, both of the uh, dominant players in that market are non-European. So it would be really nice to have a European competitor to those to the to, to in, in that retail payments market. Um, but at the same time, it's not easy, and it might actually be that um, other measures, other ways to um, disentangle that that market might be more effective. I don't know. Um, I mean, you could simply regulate. You know, through through regulation, you might be able to uh, introduce more competition into that market rather than um, offering a competing product. Mm-hmm. Open banking, for instance, would be one of the ways you can do that. And uh, I've I've been when I was the IMF, I was involved in some financial sector assessments where that that was indeed the problem that the it, the, the the banks were basically hogging the um, the rails and, and then they were putting frictions on the idea of allowing um, others to use some um, APIs and so on to to um, to piggyback on their services yeah exactly yeah okay next question um would banks be required to offer both cash and CBdc services? required that's a big that's a big word yeah i don't i I think but i think i it wouldn't work without that obviously i don't think you could run a cbtc without partnering with with the banks so at least in europe i mean in the eurozone we've already communicated that that is part of the plan first of all to use banks as or other regulated entities mostly banks as intermediaries so it wouldn't the, the digital euro wouldn't be offered directly by the by the ECB or the the euro system it would be offered through regulated intermediaries um, and how that model would actually work um, one analogy is how cash is distributed so in, in, in that sense that gives us some ideas of how that could work um, and currently banks are obliged to offer cash services and in the same way it could be regulated so that they also have to offer CBDC services. Of course, we have to think what's in it for the banks then. Um, so probably a stick alone wouldn't be enough. So it, it, that there would probably have to be some sort of arrangement which involves both a stick and a carrot. Mm-hmm. And that, that might be involved uh, enticing them to, uh, uh, you know, they, they, allowing them to offer this on a platform where they can also um, customize the, the their particular wallet so that uh, the uh, it's festooned with uh, offers to to that are run through the bank and offers to, to to borrow money or invest money and so on so they might might take there might be some way you could you could um, use that a, a carrot question from Franz Zeitz what are the main differences in motivation for CBDCs between developing transforming countries and developed countries well I think I my my motivation table kind of spoke to that the I think um, they all everyone shares the uh, um, uh, they want they want to they want to develop a more efficient uh, cost-effective payment system um, and they want to be resilient and so on but what then, then the, but after you get past the resilience and efficiency, um, uh, then then that's that's really where the EMDs are focusing and, and, and financial inclusion. That's where the emerging market countries are focusing their their thought process. Whereas when you go to advanced countries, they add on to that concerns that the those emerging markets don't have. For instance, the the shrinking use of cash um, is something that concerns a lot of advanced economies. That's not a concern of your average uh, developing country. And uh, and also monopolized, monopolized um, 
monopoly distortions in the payment market. Something also that's not that's that's more of a concern, I think, amongst the the um, uh, maybe it should be too carte blanche about that, but it, it's true that's more of a concern for the advanced economies. There are some developing economies where, you know, I have actually looked at uh, concentration ratios for various countries, and you know, there are some smaller developing countries that are dominated by you know one or two uh, banks, um, but th that's often just a function of the way the the country, you know, the country's uh, um, geography and population and so on. Obviously, that and that uh, those are probably it's the addition of that concern about shrinking usage of cash and monopolization of the um of the payment system that would you'd layer on for the um the advanced economy countries yeah i think john's um presentation covered this really well i, I mean roughly speaking you have the developing um maybe smaller countries uh, financial inclusion is, is a the key motivator for them um, for good reason, I think, you know, also the the how digitized the economy is in general, how how you know the availability of financial services, especially digital financial financial services. Um, so it might be an underserved, underdeveloped um, industry in those countries. So in, in those cases, it, it might make sense for the central bank to offer some of the some of those services, basically to bring those services to the to a wider audience, whereas in in some of the larger, maybe more developed um, economies uh, in Europe, for example, we already we have a very mature, saturated market um, in the Nordics, for example, for financial services. We have you know all the all all the mobile banking and financial services apps you could think of. Um, in in that kind of a market, um, there's not much that a CBDC or a central bank can really you know, add to to that offering. So the motivations uh, are definitely different. It could be related to resilience or you know, introducing more competition in the in the back end uh, part of the the, the landscape. Um, but that's maybe uh, the and that that's actually interesting because it it, it means that CBDC is so it's seen so differently in in different parts of the world. You know, CBDC yeah. is not necessarily the same everywhere. If you go to a certain, a certain country, um, you talk about CBDC, um, you, they might be talking about a whole different thing than when we talk about CBDC. I've lost sound. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, question from uh, Astrid Mitchell: What role and how can CBDC play uh, as a contingency backup payments mechanism in crisis situations? Oh, it's uh, currently designed there, but the, the CBDC is the, probably the one thing that's not going to work in a crisis. I'm thinking of particularly uh, natural disasters and so on. That's where that's where cash is king, unless you do have. You, you also do offer um, some value-based type of uh, type of um, media that, uh, but that's not on the on in in play right now. So in fact, uh, they, and they all talk about it too. Like the, the Bahamas launched a sand dollar, and they did um, say they they wanted to have something that was resilient to um, natural disaster risk, and they actually had some pretty funky uh, ver way of dealing with that. It was it, I think they were like mob they were they were, they were mo the mobile hotspots that could be mobilized really quickly in a in a disaster. But you know, in a real disaster, that mobilization isn't going to happen. The the roads could be strewn with with debris and trees and broken down cars and so on. So they've kind of had to backtrack on that, and they're they're still thinking about how they can actually actually achieve that. And that'd be a concern for all those island um, countries in the in the um, Caribbean and Asia Pacific that they. They better not. They better keep some cash around because that that may be what that will be the only game in town. In some cases, like in the case of Katrina, I think that uh, Haiti was out of power and internet connectivity for a month or months. That's not going to be the CBDC. Um, an account-based CBDC is not going to be of any use in that situation. Yeah, and I would I would argue that neither is neither is a, um, a value-based because if you think any any sort of value-based 
prepaid type of instrument. It needs to be pre-funded before the crisis, before the, the, the disaster. You can't, if you're, the disaster strikes, then that's too late. You, you can't pre-fund it then. It has to be pre-funded beforehand, which means you basically have to use it before. It has to be widely used already before the crisis, and that's not very likely. Um, so, so I think it's you know, for any central bank or authority that is planning uh, resilience and, and continuity and CBDC, there's nothing that beats cash in terms of resilience. And we shouldn't be fooling ourselves into thinking that we can create something, um, a, a digital version of, of something as resilient as cash. Um, so whatever you're designing when you're designing CBDC, you still need cash for the, for the real sort of um, critical situations. Uh, there's nothing that can replace that. I would argue, though, with a value-based uh, um, card, you know, usually you get lots of advance notice. When Katrina, before Katrina hit Haiti, I think they, they knew it was coming down the pipe um, a week beforehand. So I think that's that that would be the way you would react with the, with a, a stored value card. You'd, you'd, you might keep it locked away somewhere empty or with a few bucks in it, and then as you and when then when you you're alerted to this risk, then you load it up. That would be the way that would work, I should think. But you're right. Nothing beats cash. I mean, because also even the, a stored value card has to be powered up too. And you know, yeah. maybe maybe a, a, the stored value card can run say for a couple of weeks without being um, juiced up again. But eventually, it's going to run out of power. Mm. Yeah, and you need the acceptance infrastructure too for that. Mm -hmm. I think the part of the, 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 the challenge is that, in, in, at least in, in, in some countries, particularly in, 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 in developed countries, the, uh, the cash infrastructure is shrinking, typically, because banks are closing branches, ATMs, and so forth. And therefore, the, 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 the whole resilience, which works today, and we've seen that through the pandemic, uh, pretty much seeing it with the, um, the invasion of Ukraine today, um, but that re resilience risks uh, diminishing in the future. Um, and if CBDC captures some of those transactions, I fear that there might be a risk that that might accelerate the the shrinking of the cash infrastructure and therefore its um, its resilience. Um, and I think that's um, that's yeah certainly one of the challenges we we, we face in this space. Next question, France, from Francis Rice. Um, any thoughts on how CBDC use will be incentivized to encourage in adoption by, by the public and which other payment instruments will be most threatened? Well, what we've seen in practice is um, in the case of China, for instance, they've uh, incentivized the use of their, their CBDC pilot with uh, giveaways and actually uh, Uruguay did the same thing too. They, they had uh, lotteries essentially that uh, gave uh, holders um, some, some free money. It, it's not CBDC, but you'll also notice that El Salvador, when they, they made Bitcoin legal tender, they to download a Shivo wallet, you also got $30 in the account. So I think that might be a necessary thing. I don't know, in Nigeria, that, that's, a, that's a big pilot. I don't know how, if they're doing anything specific to incentivize, but Certainly no one right now is offering interest on the CBDC, which you might think would be some, some interesting way to um, incentivize the use of CBDC, although you know, currently look fairly lower interest rates. It's not too exciting to, to you know, it's nothing, nothing, more, nothing more exciting like something like $30 or even $10 in your hands right away. That, 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 rather, that gets you quite interested in downloading the wallet, but uh, you know, offering a 2% interest rate. Um, I don't think anyone's going to get super excited about that. Well, yeah. I've heard that in, in, um, in the case of Bolivia, a lot of people downloaded the wallet, cashed out the $30 and never used it again, um, which exactly. is also something that happened to PayPal when they incentivized uh, the opening of new accounts. So they realized that they had bots which were opening accounts from data centers or somewhere. Um, so I'm not sure the whole idea of incentivizing the use of all the, yeah, giving giving money away to open accounts is a is a very good idea. Alexi, anything you add? Yeah, I mean personally, I don't think that's a very 
good idea. I, I don't expect the Eurozone to do anything like that. Um, I mean, one, one kind of incentive might be that um, it's cheaper to use or it's free to use. Uh, the central bank might be in a position where it can you know, subsidize its use um, and make sure that um, at least the cost for the, for the consumer, for the end user isn't too high. So, so that might be one way to encourage the usage of a CBDC. Um, but even with that, you have to keep in mind that that might distort competition in the market and maybe be seen as unfair, um, unfair competition. Um, so it's, 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 it's difficult. I, I, I guess if you design a new payment instrument or a new product to the market, um, it should be attractive in itself. Like it, it should be, if people won't use it unless you, you know, pay them to use it, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not meant to be then. <laughs> It might depend on how, how aggressive or modest your goals are. I'm thinking the U.S. case where in the U.S. It, it's true. As I said before, you're, we're, we're, we're covered by plenty of different um, digital um, payment alternatives. But that's that's OK for a middle class guy like me. But there are people who don't have enough money to op even open an account because the account opening often incurs you incur a cost when you even just opening an account and holding a balance uh, at a at a commercial bank. Um, can be a very costly thing, even if there's no transaction fees, although there likely are transaction fees too. Like if, you, if your account's below a certain level, um, you're can, you know, you don't get, I, don't, I never pay a transaction fee when I use a debit or credit card or I take cash out of the ATM, but um, some do because they don't have the required balance. So maybe there's a, there's kind of a financial inclusion slice in almost every country that might be like that where um, I mean, the banks don't even care. They're, you're not even competing with banks because you're trying to and just bring people that are outside the financial, um, outside the formal financial sector, trying to bring them in. Yeah, and I, I actually, I, I like that idea is that you would have this kind of very, very basic payment account, which would be available to anyone for free, um, just, just for the very sort of basic services, but it wouldn't have any, add-on features or any sort of value-added stuff. So that would be something that would be provided by banks and, and payment companies. But um, every citizen would get from the government this kind of very basic payment account for free. That 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 might be a good idea. At the same time, you know, I think uh, Guillaume mentioned Walmart before, and there's a Walmart angle here too in the US that uh, Walmart, Walmart has pan partnered with American Express to offer uh, I can't remember what they call it, but they have a special card that is essentially like a, it's backed by a bank, by American Express Bank, but it's a, it offers all the things I just mentioned. It's all totally free. Um, you get a small amount of interest, no transaction charges. And the way, the way it works is the Walmart angle is that when you want to load it up with cash, you, you, you can load it up at the Walmart. You go to the cashier, give them some physical cash, and then they load it onto the American Express card, which is now fully fledged um, debit card with no fees at all. And now you can also arrange to have your social security um, and other kinds of government person payments directly deposited onto this card. So it's, it, even so in the US case, um, uh, such a, a CBDC would also be a redundant product. Hmm. John, a question for you from Jason Siemens. How does the Royal Canadian Mint's old mint chip technology compare to current CBDC effort? Seems that we're doing a lot of recycling of old technology here. I think mint chip though is a, is a Mondex like like um, product too. It's a, it's a stored value card, so it's not a. I don't think it's well. But what we know of what the Bank of Canada is looking at, I mean, they're like most central banks. They're probably focusing primarily on an account based CBDC, but they have also mentioned they, they actually called it a universal access device because they have a financial inclusion problem of another sort um canada's a big country and some parts of it are very sparsely populated and not serviced well by um internet connectivity and so on so they want to offer up a what they call a universal access device which is nothing more than a, a stored value card that can run for a long time off the grid um and so that would that be very mondex like it would be very avant like and very mint chip like but I think they, the, the Mint eventually sold that technology, didn't they, to some private company, almost like the same story as Avon. You sell it onto the, the, some banks or whatever, and then they just let it, let it die away.
That's one way, um, to, right? If, you, if someone's competing with you, you you buy the competition and then you kill it. Well, that's pretty much what's been happening in politics for the past uh, fifty years, isn't it? <laughs> well, what um, question from John Winchcombe? What investments are needed to develop and deploy CBDC? What will be the running costs of paying with the CBDC? How does this compare to the cost of electronic payments and cash infrastructure and payments? You have two minutes. Well, most of that, most of that question um, is are those are policy questions, right? But the but there actually is an infrastructure cost to the central bank of running the CBDC, in that there's some direct cost because they're going to have to develop and issue and um, a, a robust uh, cryptographically secure um, digital currency, and they have to, and there's that. Also, they may have to compensate the intermediaries in some way for for running the the system for them. And also, when you say intermediaries, you mean that also you've got to have a robust uh, supervisory and regulatory framework in place to oversee them. In some countries, that's not there. Some of the countries that are considering CBDC um, and they're planning to use intermediaries, um, their their regulatory and supervisory uh, frameworks are kind of lacking. Also, some of them have um, very small um, intern in, in IT departments. So that was, we found that to be the case in a number of countries where the central bank um, will have to beef up their IT departments big, in a very big way to uh, make sure that their CBDC is robust. But the other costs are all, you know, like fees and transaction fees. That's all, that's a policy decision that the central bank that can make. Sorry yeah, about the dog noise in the background. Yeah. Where, where the dogs will be allowed to open CBDC accounts. Yeah. Well, you know what? Well, we've got that dog Dogecoin uh, already out there, so that that, that idea has been taken. <laughs> um, Alexey, did you have anything to add? Well, I was thinking like it. It really depends on how independent you want your CBDC system to be um, of commercial providers. Um, I mean, one idea of CBDC has been that um, it would offer the, the, the public a payment instrument which uh, would be in the, which would be different from from commercial providers, would be an alternative to commercial services or services provided by commercial entities. So you wouldn't have to enter into a contractual relationship with any business if you don't want to. So that's that's sort of one justification. For example, in the Nordics, that's that's often considered an important point. And then it comes down to how much, um, you know, how independent do you want to be of any kind of commercial provider, um, and w will you actually recreate a lot of the components and services? If you think about, for example, acceptance at point of sale, will you have your own payment terminals? Will you have your own? Um, payment network with your payment scheme. Will you, will you have you know, how much of that? We have your own secure element chips and so on. Like which which part of the whole thing do you want to um, have in your own hands and, and you're controlled by yourself? And how much are you comfortable using um, uh, products from from commercial or businesses? It, 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 and yeah, as John said, it's a it's a policy question in the end. And it might vary by country. I was thinking that when you're talking about uh, point of sale terminals and so on, it, it, in, a, in advanced economy countries, you probably can piggyback on the existing rails. But in some of the developing countries, um, you, the, the, the central bank might have to bear more of the costs of, um, of the running terminals and, uh, and also building out wallets. I know of one case where the, the central bank basically has to spoon feed the, the, the intermediaries with a, with a wallet because they don't have any anything that they can piggyback on. Whereas I think in the case of China, the PBOC is, is going to require Alipay and WeChat Pay to offer CBDC as just another account line on the app. But what is it, John? The, the number is uh, 30 or so uh, countries that are in a, a, a proof of concept or, 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 or pilot phase. Um, all of those central banks confident that they can uh develop a, a, a mechanism which is more efficient than what the private sector is currently offering 
that's the question, isn't it? And I, I don't, I think that that's why they're doing proof of concepts and pilots to see if they can do it more, if they can actually attract attention or attract interest in their, their CBDC. Like I was actually on the side, someone's, uh, I was asking me, what is the, what is the success, the, the success indicators for the CBDC? And to me, it's a, essentially uptake that uptake is the key key. And we're not seeing yet any evidence of massive uptake. China makes a big deal about their million or so uh, users that have downloaded wallets, but the, I mean, the, the country's massively bigger than that. So we can't really draw too much from that. And a lot of that interest was um, attracted with these um, red letter days and other kinds of giveaways. Mm -hmm. So the jury's out. Question again from Jason Siemens. Can uh, privacy and AML concerns be resolved by enforcing wallet limits, e.g. a $1,000 balance? I presume that's Canadian dollar. Well, that's that's the way that they are doing it. And uh, I think uh, as long as you're enforcing one wallet per person and you have a hard limit, um, that, that should, in theory, um, limit the use of these wallets for doing them illicit activities but i mean that's a, in some of these tiered limit situations um the, the the upper tiers can get quite large so that we, you'd have to, to have the upper the bigger limits you'd have to have a super robust uh, onboarding um step where you, you're assured that the um the person's not going to use that for illicit activity because um that is a risk and if i if i can add on that so th there was a mention of a thousand dollars. Is that the current thinking, uh, or is that the sort of average figure? I pr presume there are differences across markets, but is that the kind of level where where we're discussing, or that's been discussed? Well, it's going to vary. And one of the one of my in my tabulation of of um, the definitional characteristics of a CBDC, one of them is that that CBDC would have to abide all uh, to all the same rules and regulations as other forms of currency. And in the US, that means, for instance, if, that if you if you'd go into the bank and withdraw over $10,000 um, of cash, there's it kicks in all kinds of um, uh, requirements for um, KYC and all, on, a lot of paperwork and so on, a lot of, um, a, a lot of regulations kick in. So you probably want to make um, at least the upper bound limit very consistent um, with that. Mm -hmm. But you know, with the, when you talk about $1,000 or $500 limits, those might be more consistent with a light a lighter onboarding KYC approach. Right. In the case of China, the very lowest level just requires that you have a SIM card. That's all. You don't, although you can identify someone by the SIM card, but uh, um, that that is the minimal level. We touched upon um, security issues. Um, the invasion of Ukraine has increased cybercrime activity. Wouldn't a CBDC become a high value target for a cyber attack? Can they be mitigated? Well, I think that is the key question. I think that that's why I mentioned earlier that you got to have a robust IT framework and and, and be has to keep up with all the latest uh, latest add-ons I, mean, I bring up the, the the situation the eastern caribbean central bank is a kind of a poster child for that that risk um, january the 4th they, they all launched their pilot sometime last year i think and then they on january the 14th the system crashed and went down it turned out not to be a hack it took two months to get it back up and running but the actually what happened is that uh, someone slipped up and didn't update one of the software certificates in the hyperledger fabric um, platform they were using and that to me, it would be that worry me if I was the governor of the ECCB, I think, OK, well, we got lucky this time. It was a hack that we were able to just close the system down before damage was done. Um, but, um, you know, we were kind of caught caught flat footed there. So I think that's really, really important. But I mean, sure, you you worry more about those risks now with the, the, the situation in Ukraine and so on. But you should worry about it all the time. Uh, you know, in the case of the Ukraine situation, you've got people just be maliciously and and just to, just to be a nuisance um, hacking things left and right but um, you know real criminals are always at work 24 7. Yeah, exactly uh, you know definitely it, it's a target um but but then any any large bank today is you know it's, it's not really that different um that's not to say that 
um, you know, it's going to be particularly attractive because you might be potentially um, you know, having accounts for every every citizen. It might be just generally speaking very very large and prominent. But um, yeah, cybersecurity is an important issue already today, as John mentioned. Even you, know, you have very large banks today that face similar challenges. And you'll notice in that table of the detailed work of the CBDC data, every central bank has outsourced the data management to the um, the private sector. And I, I, the skeptic in me thinks that, that that's mainly because the central bank doesn't want to be caught um, holding the bag when someone hacks into the system and accesses all the, the user data. So they can at least say, well, it was the it was the intermediary's fault. Although then you would have to say you have a in your regulatory supervisory framework, it would also um, very much focus on the integrity of the data being kept by the intermediaries. Hmm. In the case of uh, CBDC projects which have been launched, what has been the implication on cash demand? Yeah, well, that's an empirical question. In fact, uh, the IMF, I, I know, has is, 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 is sort of offered its, its empirical resources to the central banks that are running pilots too, um, so they can actually observe in, in, in the real world, you know, how much of that what would like to the extent people are building up cbdc balances where's it coming from are they shifting it simply out of commercial bank deposits or are they are they converting from cash so it i don't think anybody's built a model that can predict that so we have to wait and see um what kind of results are, we get from these pilots and launches mm -hmm. i think you might get some of, interesting uh, results out of china yeah in the case of avant there was no observable effect on on cash demand um, and based on um, you know, consumer research, people saw it more as a substitute for for bank products rather than cash, um, and, and you know, definitely nothing observable in, in the in the cash cycle. And this is an an interesting one from Athra Mohammed. Um, can you invest in CBDC and how? Well, if you're in, a, in one of those countries that's offering up a pilot or a launch, there's I think seven of them or six of them are, are live right now. You can do it there, but they don't. These are general; they're generally not available outside the borders of the countries where they've launched or piloted. That's that's where we get into that cross-border question, and and it's, and all all of them are basically used for domestic purposes only. So, if you happen to be in the Bahamas, yes, you can invest in the sand dollar. Um, but if you want to get a sand dollar and you're living in the U.S., um, tough luck. It's not going to happen. Mm. Because you got to be able, you got to be able to download yeah, the wallet, yeah. and the wallets are probably ge geography aware, right? They you can you could try to download a sand dollar wallet um, in in an, outside the Bahamas, but I doubt if you'd be successful. It would pick up on the fact that you're coming in from outside the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, well, we're, 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 we're pretty much uh, getting uh, close to the end of, of, of this. And, and, and per perhaps, uh, if I may, I'll ask you a last um, uh, 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 an opinion more than a question is, um, do, do, do you believe that, um, uh, and it builds on one of the previous questions, but um, do you believe that the, the, the launch of CBDC could have, would have a positive or negative impact on, 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 on cash demand? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to go with what Lexi just said, and I said all through his presentation that you know this is a sub, this is more a substitute for um, e-money and not cash. So I, I doubt if it'll have much impact at all, unless someone does offer a viable value-based card. But so far, that's not happening. Yeah, I would say I would say there's a there's a transition. Um, long-term transition from cash to all types of digital payment solutions but cbdc specifically i don't think is going to make a, a huge difference uh, so it, it's more about the digitalization of of the payment space or the economy in as a whole um, what, what we're seeing for example in the nordics um, but adding cbdc to that mix i don't think is going to make a big difference because the average person, I don't think they're going to, they, they, they don't attach a lot of value to the addition of the CB 
the CB to the DC. It's not that big a deal. And if yeah. it's a bank account, you're likely in a country that's covered by um, deposit insurance. So for the kind of sums we're talking about, um, you're not going to lose any any sleep if your bank goes kaput. You know that you're going to be you're not going to lose any money. So the CB part is not that important. Mm -hmm. Well, on that positive note, um, I would uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this, uh, this this webinar to an end. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, John and Alexi um, most kindly for your um, insight and um, fascinating uh, contributions. It's um, it's 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 obviously all this is work in progress. Things are changing. Different models are are, 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 are being used, and I think you, Alexi, mentioned that um, CBDC in in one country may not be uh, what is understood in 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 another. Um, and I think once we start scratching under the surface, we 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 realise that yeah, there there may be some common mo motivations but uh, the, 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 the way this has been built um, uh, uh, varies uh, significantly from, from, from country to country. Um, I'd also like to um, um, take away that um, cash and CBDC are, are, are still very different animals. Um, and that cash, uh, and, and that um, cash is probably not facing a major threat um, or, or, uh, from the development of, 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 of CBDC. Um, and uh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there are still um, many more uh, uh, questions that uh, remain uh, un unanswered, both in terms of policy and, 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 and technology and I'm sure we'll find more as, a, as we go ahead um, um, but um, I am um, <clears throat> I've personally found this quite 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 reassuring to have um, your expert opinion on this um, so again thank you very much to you both um, would also like to extend my thanks to um, the reconnaissance team behind the scenes that um, have made this uh, work almost without glitches. Um, I would like to add that um, we'll be, our, our next cash talk, um, uh, we've not quite yet finalized the dates, but that will be held in, um, in, 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 in May. Um, we'll focus on, uh, on, 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 on cash tech and how cash tech can facilitate access and acceptance of cash. Um, and then in uh, May, June, we'll be holding um, some very exciting futures literacy labs on um, the future of cash and money. Um, so please follow our website for, for, for further information and dates. Um, with that, um, thank you all very much. Stay safe and um, see you next time. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.